Danielle Tricciano, um, I don't know what she told you about me, so I'm not really going to tell you anything about me. Um, I'm an I'm a entertainment editor, I've worked for a million websites. Um, one of my favorite things is to write about comedy because I can't do comedy. So I'm very excited to be here and to be talking with these fabulous people. I don't know if they can hear me, I hope they can. So we'll bring them out. Creator, showrunner, and star of a black lady sketch show, Robin Thede. Co-creator and showrunner of Rutherford Falls, Sierra Teller Ornelas. And creator and showrunner of Grand Crew, Phil Augusta Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah. Like, no pressure. First thing in the morning on a Friday. What up, what up, what up, what up? Sarah, would you like to Thank say you. something to the crowd? So we just need content, okay? It's a era of content. <laughs> Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, okay. It's weird when oh, people wait, call it. Oh, wait, I'm supposed to do that? I don't know. <laughs> No, I do this weird Native American thing, and she yes. wants me to do it now. Yes. Okay. Get ready. Ready for the Native yes. American thing. Okay. Yat a Sierra Nelson she tapahe nishle nakai ne bashchin tuagli ni tushche do nakai ne shinali. My name is Sierra Taylor Nellis. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation. I'm Edgewater clan born for the Mexican people. Traditionally, when Navajos come to TV and film festivals, we first introduce ourselves by saying our clans. So thank you and welcome. Yes. You can too if you want yeah, to. No, um, I don't have a thing. No, I mean, it's fantastic. So, one of the things I really love about this group of people in this panel is that, like, it, I feel like you're a great representation of the fact that, like, there are so many avenues right now for the content of comedy. I mean, sketch comedy on a premium cabler, single camera on a streamer, single camera on a broadcast. So there's really no, like, one path, one way. I was hoping we could kind of start by talking about your influences that brought you to this type of comedy. Maybe we can start with you, Phil. This type of comedy, interesting. Uh, I mean, when it comes to Grand Crew being on NBC, it's the first place that we pitched, and they were like, uh, we're trying to, trying to buy that. So that's, <laughs> that's why it ended up on NBC. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's no nuance to the answer other than that. Um, however, I, you know, the, the style of comedy of the show, you know, I, I, I'm a kid in the 90s. Um, and so I grew up, you know, classic sitcoms. We're talking about Living Singles, talking about Jamie Foxx show, talking about Seinfeld, talking about Friends. Like these are all shows that I just really, really loved to watch when I was younger, and love to rewatch even today. Um, and so uh, the show itself, I think, is kind of an amalgamation of those influences, among other things, and um, which is kind of my own personal touches on it. So that's that's kind of the one, the one to answer when it comes to to Grand Crew being on NBC and the, and the style of comedy of the show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we pitched NBC and they did not pick it up, but then we <laughs> ended up taking it around town and um, I, we were at a streaming site that ended up not picking us up. And by the time we were done pitching and making things and it getting passed on, Peacock was a brand new network and they had um, gotten a hold of the script and loved it and were like, we want to make this. And so we were like so excited to kind of be on the ground floor of a platform. And I do think, you know, because there's so many options in so many places, there are a lot of marginalized, you know, voices that are now getting opportunities that I don't think would have been able to be possible 10 years ago. But I do think, like, thematically in terms of the comedy of Rutherford Falls, I also grew up on a lot of 90s comedies and 80s comedies, so, like, Designing Women, A Different World. There were always these, like, shows where people were, like, making speeches and, like, <laughs> taking stands. And, like, if you look at, you know, the Terry Thomas character, he has a monologue every episode, specifically because um, I always grew up just, like, loving, loving that kind of television. Oh, man, I want a little startup called HBO, and... <laughs> that's a flex, that's a flex. I hope yeah, they're gonna yeah. make it. Uh, yeah, who doesn't want to be on HBO? I, I did, I actually, so you know this story, Danielle, but I sold the sketch show when I was doing my late night show on BT. I sold it to another place. Thank you for that, Woo, thank you. Um, and I sold it to another place, but we couldn't kind of settle on the budget. Like sketch, everybody, to be fair, everybody gets $5 to make sketch. And so they were well within the correct range of what people pay for sketch. And I am well within the reckless belief that I deserve more. And so... <laughs> 
wait, can I just really quickly, everyone has seen season three of A Black Lady Sketch Show, right? Okay. The reason I'm asking is because like, she proved that the sketches are connected to the narrative, so like, it is, it is more similar, I think, to what you yes. are doing in your longer form storytelling yeah. than the title sketch might. I, I agree, and, and that was kind of the thought going in, and even though we didn't say that forward facing, but, um, so this, this very unknown person named Issa Rae came to me. It's a flex, Again, it's a you flex. You'll get to know her. You'll get to know her, yeah. She's, she's pretty good. Um, she called me when my late night show got canceled. She said, what's going on with the sketch show? And I was like, oh, I don't think I want to make it there. I only pitched it one place. And then I was like, maybe I'll take it other places. She goes, bring it to HBO. So we brought it to HBO. They bought it at the dinner. Denzel paid for the check. That's a whole other story. <laughs> Casual. That's a flex. <laughs> It's not a flex, it's just a fact. And... <laughs> no, it was crazy. We pitched at this restaurant. The only other person in there was Denzel Washington. And then the, at the end of the meeting, it's going really well, and, and the, our executive, Amy Gravett, is like, yeah, we want to buy it. And Denzel apparently overheard it. And he leaves. He leaves before our meeting is over. We don't even notice when he leaves, but we're like, oh, man, we didn't get to say hi to Denzel. And the waitress comes over, and she says, the gentleman paid for your check. <laughs> So we better were, than saying hello. Right, yeah. right. So he's our good luck charm. But yeah, I mean, that HBO just made sense not only to make it with my friend, the powerhouse that is Issa Rae, but also the powerhouse. I mean, HBO, you know, it's not TV, it's HBO, right? Like, I grew up watching. <laughs> they make me say that. I know, we're not, I don't think we're allowed to say that anymore because, like, TV is a seven-hour film or whatever I everyone's know, saying. I know, I know, I well, know. I feel, are you bitter about Stranger Things? What is that, I'm not right allowed now? to say that. They're recording me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Shade. And that's why, listen, that's why I'm happy to be on this comedy panel because you guys, whether it's half hour comedy or some shows actually get to play a little bit more when you have streamers, you don't have, you know, 22 minute restrictions. 21 minutes and 20 seconds. Really? The worst. The worst. Damn. Well, listen, when I sold the sketch show, I thought I was making a 20 minute sketch show, and then HBO was like 28 minutes, and I was like, oh no, I need to write more. We have writers. the opposite problem because I'm oh. cutting jokes left and right, like, Am I allowed to curse? Yeah. I'm like, fuck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the cursing is so nice. Yeah, well, you know, you but, were on Insecure. You uh, yeah, know, you were. You, I use those yeah. bleeps, though. Like, we get those bleeps. We get the bleeps. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, too, is like, if you do have a time constraint, how firm it has to be, and how you tweak your own story, your own writing knowing you may be leaving something you love and that yeah. is amazing on the floor. Yeah. Like, what can you say to any aspiring writer in the audience about that? Oh, you've got to learn to keep it short. <laughs> keep it short. Keep I it mean, short. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Even we, are, we're, we have a two-minute window, so we're 26 and a half to 28 and a half, and that includes all the end credits and all that stuff. So this year, we actually got smart, and as opposed to tacking on the end credits and adding time at the end, we allowed more time by doing a squish with the credits and letting the outtakes roll. So we made sure that we got enough, you know, a minute of outtakes over the credits, but that allowed us an extra minute in the show. So that was nice, because it is really, really dense, but it's hard. I mean, Very people hard. are like, why is that joke in the outtakes? And I'm like, because I couldn't fit it in the, you know, so. Yeah, it's hard, especially with my cast. There's so many extra jokes just wasted on the cutting room floor. <laughs> no, so, we, yeah, we try to keep our scripts really short, and like, we've shot How like, long are they? Because how long, what is your With the pandemic, because we had like, one less day, and then we, it's like a visually more interesting show. Like, I, I can't imagine, like, with the production value of your show, and then also trying to do everything you're doing. So we, we've shot like 25 page scripts, like, and usually like, it's, you know, 30 to 32, you know, but we shoot very short, and then, um, we can go as long as 28 minutes oh, okay. and as short as 23, but I like, I don't love comedy when it's super long and drawn out. Yeah. Like, you see a lot of streaming comedies that are just like, I could cut three minutes off of this. Yeah. And so we try to be really, really judicious about, about the stuff and keep it, keep it moving, keep it fast. Fast is funny. My packet for the whole season is about 350 pages. <laughs> it's a lot. A lot of pages. <laughs> In six episodes. It's a lot. Yeah, our... Our scripts are, I try and get as close to 30 as we can, but they usually end up around 33. Oh, you must be cutting so much. Cut cut you cut if you keep lot. it short. Why are you doing that to yourself? You don't fall I love. can't, I can't stop. When we were You're not on HBO anymore. It's, it's not, it's not, I was gonna say it's not TV, it's NBC, but that's not, <laughs> that's not what it is. It's not, it's just it's TV. Exactly TV. <laughs> it is TV, it's, ne it's network TV, it's NBC. Yeah, so we, um, we're like at 33 pages, but that's with like act breaks, so really it's around 31, 
Um, and I say sure the, it is, sure it is. Guys, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I'm so close to thirty That's pages. what you're telling yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm telling myself. But um, I think the the thing for that we that I try and keep in mind is like the story comes first, right? You can always beat the joke. So if you when you're in the edit bay, if it's there's a really funny thing, but it's not connected to story, those are the first things to go. And the hope is that you hang on to as much funny stuff as you can. But for an audience, I believe to really latch onto the characters in the story is just keeping the stuff that has the actual story trajectory to it, so. But you guys both have comedians on your That's show, like thing. real comedians. Yeah. So, yeah. They're gonna be improvisers. That's Improv why we keep it short, yeah. so they have room to like, and time to like add and You change. need shorter scripts! Uh, <laughs> I know. We, yeah, yeah. Do you guys yeah. feel like- So many funny people on that show. <laughs> do you feel like we're in a world though where like, if you're cutting all of that, can you go to your networks and say, can we do something with this as an, a digital short, an online, like can we give something to the audience that's an extra? Or do you want to leave it on the Parks cutting and Rec used to do like producers cuts on Hulu and stuff, so it wouldn't be on network. You could do like longer cuts, and I would always watch those. But it's hard with like network because it's yeah. the commercials and the stringent time and stuff. You really have we to. We did blo we did bloopers, but that's that's a different thing. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, but uh, so I guess the short answer is no. We haven't done that, but that's a good idea. You need like I'm available scenes. to you consult. You need like the Schneider you cut of your so show. Get some cut scenes, get the producers cut. That's nice. I mean, I feel like you should. I would watch the, oh, way yeah. more than the 22 minutes. The problem is, by the time I finish editing these 50 short films every yeah. season, I don't want to cut anything else. So I'm sure I could, but I just, I'm tired. Yeah, that's fair. That's no fair. one realizes how dense it is. And like, we're on a loca different location every day, new characters every day. It's like reinventing a sitcom every day, sometimes twice a day. Yeah. So yeah, no, I'm just too tired, but I'm sure they might. Mm -hmm. Um, so you we released um, eight minutes of outtakes, though. Like, yeah, all and the, I think the outtakes are yeah. great, but it, but I do think that's also kind of a different kind of comedy almost because we're watching yeah. these like people at the top of their game break each other, which is fun. We don't. Our outtakes are just extra jokes. They're rarely ever being broke. Like we don't do bloopers. If you notice, like they're, it's rarely ever somebody like laughing or fucking up their line. It's like, um, can I say line? Um, <laughs> Every time I say the F word, I just ask for permission for another one. Yeah, anyway, whatever. I like your sandals. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I just don't put on real shoes anymore. Oh, um, those are fantastic. I, so I want to bring up something, uh, I don't mean to call anybody out, but jo the joy of uh, Chew Monkey Productions was a pitch competition judge yesterday. And she said something that I thought was really interesting that I want to get you guys to take your take on. Because she was talking about how like when you have a half an hour comedy, it really needs to be more character driven than plot engine driven. And I'm curious how much you might agree with that. And if that actually is how you think of writing as character first versus I need to hook, especially when you're talking about trying to sell these shows. I don't think I agree. Cause like Brooklyn Nine Nine, we had we worked on Brooklyn Nine Nine together. Oh, yeah, no big yeah, deal. Yeah, sure. Sure. And that was like a really interesting exercise where you had to do a full like drama procedural and have all of yeah. that plot and story. But then you'd have these like I think well defined characters just help you make comedy. So like classic opposites and like create comedic engines. But I love twists and turns. I love having like real story in in a in a comedy. So yeah. It's interesting because like, there's two parts to it, right? It's to sell it. I think you, you obviously have to have dynamic characters and without being in a pitch to say, here's the 22 stories that we're gonna do right. on a network in season one, I think you, you need to understand the characters and the premise. So in that regard, I you can- Y'all had 22 could, episodes? Yeah, at Brooklyn, yeah, yeah, Brooklyn was a- Oh, I thought you meant on Grand Crew. No, 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 we can say that. That's a 10 piece. But he's coming piece. back for season two, so. Listen, I yeah, love it. We got 10 in season two, yeah, it's 10, that's, yeah. I just, 22 just seems insurmountable these days. I don't it's know. It's a lot, it's a lot. of television. It's a lot of TV to write, yeah. Yeah, okay, anyway, finish, sorry. No, it's all good, no, it's all good. Uh, yeah, so I think, but the, but when it comes to actually making this show, I think uh, the sto story is, is critical. I think they go hand in hand. I don't know, it's I feel it's like you need a, like, everyone always needs like a hook because they're like, I think if you have great characters, that's great, but like, there's only so many types of characters when you're pitching a show. So it's usually like, and then she's a ghost or something, yeah. right? <laughs> and like, that gets you like, it get made. But I think the smarter shows that I've worked on, they bail on the premise. So like when I worked on like Happy Endings. Um, hey, hey. Yeah. Come on credits, come yeah, on credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been doing this for a while. Um, that, you know, the hook of that was like, when a woman like leaves at the altar, runaway bride, what happens after, right? But the second we kind of 
got done with that storyline. It was just a hangout show with like eight friends and was really fun. And so I think a lot of times you need that hook to get made and get picked up. But to have that sort of escape hatch of like, then when we have to make a bunch of these, because you can't really like depend on a hook for a whole season. Can I add an addendum to my answer, please? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I got so formal there, but I would say it, it, when it comes to pitching, I would say it's like insight, premise, and then character character, like in that order? Like what's the insight behind it? Like why would people tune in? What's the premise that's gonna bring that to life? And then the characters, the dynamic characters. To me, that is the order of operations, I think, to, to sell the pitch. I disagree with everything. Um, <laughs> I mean, it also might be who you're pitching to, but I that's think true. it is. That's Look, I think you have to have interesting characters that are gonna, gonna go on a great journey, right? Like, I'm not, like, Seinfeld, arguably, you could say, was mostly about character, right? Rather, I mean, the stories mattered, but like what the characters did was why you tuned in. But then there's things that like the hook are was, very story forward. But the hook was, it's a show about nothing. That's right. true. It's That's like, we're going to do the anti sitcom. That's sitcom. true. So it's That's like, true. yeah. So I think it can work both ways. But yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, story is really important, actually. Even on a sketch show, like, story is still really important because our characters, you meet them many times yeah. so they need to have journeys where they're growing and changing and having different conflicts and all of that kind of stuff but if you have to pick you can only take one do you take story or character because to her point i would take character i mean i'd have to say character yeah, yeah you know what i mean so yeah so I, I don't think character one... doesn't exist without story i mean that's this is just true. true and i don't think there's one right answer i think it depends on the show no no there's one answer we need to figure it out right now <laughs> we have to find well, there's one answer we're gonna figure it out right now <laughs> like the perspective, right, of every show. Because we're constantly hearing, write what you know. There needs to be, especially in these pitches, there needs to be like, some of you, why are you the one telling this story? I, I don't, you know, want to put anyone here on the spot in terms of how personal you want to get right now, but I am curious how much of yourself and your own journey do you find important to put in your current show? I mean, great, I, I in great crew, might have, is just about my life. It, it's just. <laughs> you can say a, as little or as much about that as you're comfortable sure, with. I don't want to like. Sure, need let's you. Get, I can get specific. So I live. Uh, Grand Crew is a show about uh, a group of friends hanging out on the east side of Los Angeles. I live on the east side of Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, they patronize a wine bar. There's a wine bar called. That I hang out. And with my friends. And now they're all going to find uh, you there next yeah. weekend. What's up? Now everyone's going to stalk you yeah. there next weekend. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there, guys. She said, we like wine. <laughs> yeah, I like wine. And uh, even like stuff down to like the cold open. Where, uh, for anyone that's seen the show, like there's a cold open where one of our characters comes in dressed in white and wine gets sprayed on. Like I spilled wine all over my friend one time. <laughs> so it's like very much pulled from the pages of, of my life. But obviously, I think, you know, for networking the tone of this show with all the inspirations I talked about earlier, it's, it's, it's heightened. And, um, but yeah, even the, some of the stuff we talk about uh, topically is, is kind of is imbued in the show too, which is fun. Yeah, I would say the show is like very personal. It's, it's set in the Northeast and my tribe is from the Southwest, so we try to be very accurate and respectful to that region. However, I grew up in museums. My mom is a master Navajo tapestry weaver. So a lot of my life was making art and having white people explain what that art meant in front of me. <laughs> well, I was like, like, actually, no, that's a Pac-Man ghost. It's not a <laughs> god or, you know. And, and that sort of absurdity of the Native American experience to be like a walking curio constantly um, is like kind of at the heart of a lot of Rutherford Falls of, of feeling, you know, marginalized and what that erasure feels like, but also just sort of like that kind of like Woody Allen absurdity of it. Um, was sort of my experience um, growing up. And I think we draw a lot of that um, half our writer's room is indigenous writers from all over yes. the states. And we talk a lot about different issues and we don't always see things the same way, but once a conversation kind of starts up of like, actually, I disagree, blah, 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 we're like, okay, that's a story, let's chase that. How do we make that funny? How do we like dramatize that? Um, but yeah, a lot of it comes from our own personal life and our own personal stories. And like the character of Regan specifically is very much, um, you know, it's not hyperbolic to say like most Native women on film and television like don't make it to the third act. They're usually like murdered so that the like white guy can like figure out what's important about life and like solve the crimes. 
And so, you know, so to have a Native woman um, be one of the co-leads, to have her be funny, is just really, it is really kind of revolutionary because it's something like we just never get. I honestly think this panel is like a few years ago. These, I don't know if these shows would have been on on, on at the same time. Um, personal. I am Dr. Hadassah, so yes, yeah, well, it's very personal. <laughs> <laughs> now we rip things from people all the time. People in our lives, and you know, find inspiration constantly. Yeah, because we play like 300 characters. So. And that's but what thing. I love about your show, though, is it's not just like pulled from life. It also like like the ashy sketch. I love <laughs> so much. Because it took this thing that's like so viscerally relatable and it like dramatized it to this like high level because that's what it feels like. Like I love that you take these experiences and make them like truly dramatic in this like hilarious way. It's it's so good. And I mean you can And I am the devil. So that's <laughs> Uh, Sarah, you already touched on this in terms of like your writer's room, but that is a big part of it too, because obviously like perspective, not just your perspective as the person running the show, welcoming other perspectives and creating a room where they feel comfortable and safe to be honest, because I feel like a lot of comedy comes from like finding the most embarrassing stories. How that ashy you... Sunday sketch was because that happened to one of our writers. Oh. <laughs> she walked out to brunch and she for some reason just didn't put lotion on from the ankles below. <laughs> And it was, she was just like, I'm going to have to make a deal with the devil to get some love. And then she did. I'm like checking my hands right now, making sure. <laughs> so I'm sure she loves that we're talking about Phil, this. I have love. Yeah, so. so that, I mean, literally my question is just how do you create that safe space? What is the most important thing about creating a room where people can find the humor in I, their own pitfalls? I'm sure this is like this for you guys. Let me know. But I remember the first day of season one of a black lady sketch show, Ashley Nicole Black, this is her story. She's told it. She's amazing. Literally a genius. Um, she came in the room and she's, and we all said, okay, we're going to start pitching. You know, we got to know each other, whatever. And then we all just kind of looked around like, holy shit, there's nothing but black women in here. This is crazy. And then we were like, okay, let's pitch, you know? So Ashley's like, okay. So there's this singer. Her name is Patti LaBelle. She's a, and, and I go, wait a minute. You don't have to do that here. She's the only black person. And I go, you don't have to do that. She goes, oh, uh, okay, so this woman, every time she breaks up with somebody, Patty LaBelle shows up and won't leave until she sings on my own with her. And, and then she goes, and then, and I go, stop, stop, stop. Go write it. <laughs> the end. Like, I don't need you to explain anything else. That's fucking genius. You know, so like, I think there's a shorthand that you have in a room where people are not all the same, but they have a commonality and they have been underestimated other places they've been. And when you take off the trauma of being a token in a room or the only in a room or not being listened to in a room, it really frees you up to do your best work. And I think that's why creators like us do well when we're breaking ground. There has never been a show like yours. There's never been the Black Cheers or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, like I don't know. It's, and that's oh all I see. Oh, 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 guys, I did not. I did not. That was, she said that. I said that it. Is, that is, that is, that is. That's how it makes me feel. Because it's like, it's so fun and they all come in. Everybody knows their name. Like, it's just, it, that, it gives me that nostalgia. I don't know if that's an insult. I, I'm saying it's it not a compliment. an insult. Okay, it's okay. very like, early. Yeah. Well, that's fair. Very early. Season two, we're cheers. Uh, no, but I'm saying it, I'm saying it. But, but my show, A Black Woman Has Never Created a Sketch Show, period, like, like this, um, uh, there was one in the UK. That, let me be clear, there was one in the UK. Um, but, um, but, you know, on American television, of this scale and this size, this has never happened. So I think the reason why people resonate with shows like this is A, because people are bored of seeing the same things, right? <laughs> How many times can we see six white friends on a show or four white friends on a show or whatever? It's like, okay, we get that. We know that experience. And there's still room for that, but there's also room now for these stories as well. And in a landscape where, I mean, you know this, we've talked about this like five, 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, there were maybe 200 shows on the air and now there are like five to 600. So, you know, with that kind of volume, it's like, we celebrate like our three projects, but it's like, really, there should be like 100 out of the 600 that are on, but there's still like maybe 12 that have like, you know, our kind of point of view. So we can still do better. Like, I think we, a lot of the times try to like, you know, it's like, oh, look, well, look, you know, we're examples, shining examples of our, of our communities, but um, we're just the ones that got through. 
we all know people who look like us who could be doing this 10 times better than we are. You know what I mean? And like, that's no shade to us. It's just that the talent is there. Yeah. So. And like 20, 30 years ago, like yes, there were yeah. native, like Charlie Hill was an amazing native stand up and should have had a show like Roseanne. You know, there are so many people. I, I completely agree. Yeah, no, on our writer's room, it's half native, half non-native. And um, some of the best rooms I've worked in have been in like teaching hospitals, basically, where you have kind of like seasoned writers, you have newer writers. The newer writers have come with all of this excitement and kind of stories to pitch. The seasoned writers teach and explain, like, this is structure, you don't have to do it, but this is how we do it, blah, blah, blah. And so in our room, it was so fascinating to watch, like, grizzled comedy writers hear a new story. You know, it's not just like my time at Northwestern. It was like a genuine, like, original. Excuse you, I went to Northwestern. Sorry. Hey. Oh, shit. I went to University of Arizona, and we're on the same couch, so. <laughs> State school, state school pride. Uh, but no, and so, you know, it's this feeling of like watching them hear a new story. Like I remember um, Tazma Chavez, who is a writer and directed two episodes this season, it's incredible. For her, in her meeting, she talked about how her aunt had a police scanner because like on different reses, you listen to police scanner, you're like, oh, Randy's in trouble or whatever. You like know the gossip of what everyone's doing. And my aunt Linda, who wanted to be a cop, she had a police scanner. So we were just telling police scanner stories, and Ad was like, I've never heard of this. Like, this is amazing. Like, this is an episode. We have to do this. And so she was like, I've never been in a meeting where, like, someone knew about the police scanner. And then when we got into wow. the room, like, most of the native writers had a police scanner story. <laughs> and so, but it's just one of those things where, like, the writers who are not native were so excited to, like, have a new story to work on. And the native writers were, like, so excited to share and have that space to genuinely not feel like, okay, we have to explain Indians 101 to everybody yeah. because we just started talking, and then people had to kind of, like, catch up to us, which rarely ever happen. Yeah. How, how many? We had like between 11 and 13, depending on where we were the season. Yeah. We have like eight small, eight. small ball. Yeah. Small. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have nine this season. Um, but yeah, I agree with everything you guys are saying. I think also writers' rooms are uh, very intimidating places uh, to work because. Um, Why is your writers' room so intimidating? No, mine, <laughs> mine, mine, mine is not. <laughs> Mine is not, but that's a perfect segue. Um, I think because, you know, you're, when you're pitching like something that you think is funny, it's like, hey guys, I think this is funny. And then, depending on the room that you're in, sometimes it could just be like crickets and like that shit doesn't feel good. Do you know what I mean? And so I think uh, for me, uh, taking the best experiences that I had in a writer's room, it was saying on the first day, hey guys, just share the pitch. The ideas can come from anywhere. Episode 105, two of the three stories were pitched by a writer's assistant. So it's really just flattening, flattening that, that hierarchy and just being like, guys, we all have ideas here and the best idea wins. Pitch the thing just because uh, it, there, it might not get the reaction that you want, that could lead to an idea that explodes the explodes the whole the whole story in a good way or gets everybody kind of you know crying laughing and stuff like that. And so I think for me the simple answer is just like as the leader, it's like just being like, guys, just pitch the thing. Like, I'm gonna pitch some stuff and you guys aren't gonna maybe think it's that funny, but eventually, uh, air conditioner agrees. Um, uh, eventually, eventually, you know, we'll get we'll get to the story and we're all kind of on the same team. So But what if the idea is really stupid? <laughs> I don't know. What do you do? Like, what do you say to a writer? But, what do you say? Know, They're like, like, we're gonna fill the pool with yogurt, and then everybody's gonna jump in, and then what do you say? I don't know, but it's like stupid, <laughs> stupid, 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 and then brilliant. It's like a circle. If it's no, so dumb. As, as the person running the room, I want to know what you say to that writer. Do you go, okay, or do you go like, yeah, or do you go, maybe not this season, or how do you handle it? Well, give me an example, and I'll tell you how Somebody react. literally is like, fill the pool with yogurt, and then everybody strips naked. That shit sounds like, hilarious to me, though. <laughs> Honestly, if you see a, if you see a pool full of yogurt in Grand Cru season two, you know what? You guys have like a fun party and, and stuff. Yeah, that's into true. The pool, and I forgot like, oh, you I literally swim. filled it's the pool. Water. Yeah, you guys actually do stuff like that's that. Funny. That's funny. Really that's you know what? funny. Never to mind. Me. No, but I mean, it is. I think that is a, a thing I would worry about, like as a writer. Yeah, that rejection. That rejection. Yeah, I, I would say also, especially, especially from the person running the room. Oh, the I was say Zoom were like. Did my audio cut out or is nobody laughing because it wasn't good? Oh, I've had my writers go, sometimes your jokes just don't land, Robin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like, shit to me. It like, goes back yeah. to like, how honest do you feel like you can be with your room? Do you as you a have, to, have to set a boundary though where you feel like, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. No. What if they go to HR? No, no, no be well, no, that makes sense. I know what you're saying. I, 
think you have to be a fundamentally decent person, first of all. And if you're not, then yeah, you do need to think about shit like that. <laughs> Why is that crazy shit all the time? Like, well, obviously. <laughs> but I say crazy shit all the time. My writers know, like, day one, they're like, oh, she's chaotic, got it. So I think I get it. Comedians get a little leeway, but you obviously cannot abuse people. Like, you just, I'm so empathetic, especially having made two of our last three seasons in COVID. Like, it's been crazy, and we know that for for our audience, this is the only, these six episodes are the joy they get for most of the year, you know? Like, so we take that really seriously, and, and so I think we just always try to keep the goal in mind. But when people do have, like, say somebody has, like, a pitch that just um, isn't producible or just isn't landing the way it needs to, I think I try so hard to make it into something that will work. So that's what I try to do to a fault. I'll spend an hour trying to work on a pitch and the writers are like, can we go right? Um, but yeah, I just kind of never give up on an idea. We do cut sketches all the time, but not without trying. So the writer at least feels they had two or three passes at it to try to figure it out. And we try to have a really like strong, kind of soft outline of what the season's gonna be. So we kind of have like a good backbone that people can pitch off of. We've broken like, when someone will say, that wouldn't actually happen. Like, you'd have to go to tribal council first. So we'll blow it up. But at least starting from a place of, like, this is what we want and trying to be clear about what we want. I thrived on getting bullied in writer's rooms, unfortunately. <laughs> Just because it was like, yeah, knock me down. I'm going to keep getting up. I'm going to keep getting yeah. up. And so, like... I think, you know, the newer, younger generation of writers just do not thrive on being bullied. Yeah. And, and they're I really mean, nobody good. should. No, but I think that there's... But a, we there's were a, that generation, for I sure. Think, and I think there's, like, a thick skin. Like, you have to be able to handle rejection. No one's saying you have to be, like, abused. But I do think, like, it's about, like... Like, you don't get good at golf unless you swing, right? Like, you have to do it a bunch of times and build those muscles up. And so I try to, like, encourage them. I'll be like, your pitch died. Keep going. You know, yeah. or like there was a writer, um, Irosaji, who gave me this great advice where he was like, if you have a great pitch, like a home run pitch, or a pitch that dies, take a knee. Just like take a minute. Yeah. Because yeah. don't try to build on your like yeah. win either. It can still go bad. And so I'll try to just sort of, it's almost like a mushroom trip where you like walk them through. Like, so you got rejected. <laughs> That's really hard. But you're going to have some ideas and then like over lunch. It's like, now gonna, like, I get it. I'm yeah. listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's like one of those things because like when I was like a producer level writer, you'd have like staff writers be like, what happened? What did I do? And I was like, okay, so don't call her mom because she's not that much older than you or whatever. And like, it's like, I can't even talk about it. But like, <laughs> and I'm like, so that's why none of your pictures are getting in this room because you called her mom yesterday or whatever. Like, so I, like when I was staffing, <laughs> when I was staffing, when I was staffing our room, like one of the questions I asked is like, who are you and your family? So someone would be like, oh, I'm the big sister, I'm the little brother, or I'm the da-da-da. And I tried to like I put together. Mom. I can't. Hold on. <laughs> I feel so bad. She was really nervous and she was trying to she bond. She called another writer mom. So like say like I'm like a yeah, writer. Okay. And she's like, oh my God, you're like my mom. Oh! Okay, got it, got it. Very bad, very bad. And that woman was just like, yeah. you just don't do that in a comedy writer's room in the early aughts. And so, so I do think like I'll work out who this was by the end of the day. Okay. I felt so bad telling the story now, but no. But I think like sometimes people don't know that they've done something wrong, or they yeah. don't know what they're doing wrong. Yeah. So like, I always wanted to know. Like, just yeah. tell me I'm bad. Tell me the script sucks. Like whatever. But why? Yeah. But why? And like explain to me. And I had really like rough mentors that would be like, this doesn't make sense, or like you want to do this here, but now this needs to happen four beats later, or whatever. So I think transparency and kindness, if you can kind of mix those two together giving people the freedom to pitch, but also having that boundary of like, these are the expectations, this is what we're working towards together, I think is helpful. Yeah. But it's also hard because like, these are the first time like native writers are telling these stories. This is the first time they're yeah. sharing. And there is a huge legacy of like extraction and of exploitation. So you have to really be mindful, I think, of, of those experiences. And it's not like any average comedy room where, but you are trying to be like really, really funny. You know, so you wanna create a space where people can actually share because there are a lot of comedy rooms where like best joke wins and it's like a lie <laughs> it's like a weird like toxic family and so to have like i think showrunners who actually do that is like the best thing yeah and that's true i can vouch your writers do say that about you they love you uh oh they you. love you thank you it's baseball it's like if you're batting if you bat like 300 you're we like we are tv people i don't yeah. want to assume we understand baseball, it's baseball. Yeah. okay like a league is our sitting here with these sports and now i'm talking to my i'm talking to my you man it's baseball <laughs> Talk to you're like, keep going, you got it. 
Yeah, so I don't know that much about baseball. <laughs> I feel a lot of pressure now. I'm like, oh God, what have I done? But it's, if you bat like 300, you're like the, you're one of the best, best okay. in the league. That's three out of ten. That's that's 30 percent, right? Yeah. Right, mommy? Right? That's crazy. Last year in MLB, the league average is like less than 250. Oh, right? that's very helpful. It's thank so, you, sir. It's so. <laughs> Thank you. So if you if you if you pitch if if you're pitching I, to me it's like baseball. It's like if you bat 250, you're like you're an all star, right? And then so anything below that is just setting the expectation that like you're not always going to hit a home run, you're not always going to get on base. But the, the the thing is, if you're swinging, like you're winning in a in a writer's room. Yeah. And I think also as like a, I have an improv background, and so a lot of times, as long as the writer is on topic. Chances are, You're gonna get there. I'm gonna, we're gonna find yeah. it. I'm gonna build off of something yeah. that's gonna get to something that's gonna get to something. And so I think yeah. it's just setting that expectation and letting them know that like, yeah. just because it doesn't show up on the page doesn't mean you didn't contribute to the finished product because we're all just trying to figure it out, you know? Yeah. So there's different types of pitching too. So we've had writers in the room that are just like the rat-a-tat-tat, like the, just, just a ton of jokes, My, you know, a hundred jokes, maybe two of them are good, but they just are relentless. And then we've had the silent ones that are like silent but deadly. So they like maybe once an hour just drop a joke. Snipers. Oh, snipers. Ooh. Oh, we gotta stop using gun references Ooh. in all this. Sorry, I know. Guys. We have to, yeah. we're learning. Yeah. We're learning. Yeah. So yeah. be patient with us. I keep Sorry. There's you a guys, lot of gun references. And I do not mean to make that general. No, I know. No, seriously. But I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Yeah. I wanna cur curtail my language. Because we are people like, who think about language. Like we yes. killed it, we murdered it. Like I know. I'm like trying to use like matriated it or something. Oh, like, God. <laughs> we like it's hard. Burst you got shit out of it. Yeah, it's hard. But I was gonna say, for those of you who wanna be in a room or have been in a room, think about what kind of pitcher you are. Like, where are your strengths? You don't have to do what other people do. Like, maybe you're somebody that just constantly has jokes. Maybe you're somebody who's really good with story. Maybe you're somebody who's really good with character games. Maybe you're somebody who's really, you know, just figure out what your style is and stick with that. Also know what the room dynamics are and like take that first day or two. Don't take forever, but take the first day or two to kind of read it. Because for scripted, you guys can tell me if it's different in your rooms, but when my writers leave and go to scripted shows, sometimes they get in trouble because on my show, it's chaos. Just pitch, pitch, pitch. Everyone just like pitch, pitch, pitch. And um, they do that in scripted rooms where they're like the low level writer and they're like, hey, hey, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> There are eight producers in this room. We don't need all that from you. So I think you just kind of have to gauge it, right? Yeah, like Princess Penny, who show an insecure when yeah, 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 yeah. best human. Um, my first couple of weeks on Happy Endings, like I didn't talk. I was like, it was my first job in television. I was very nervous. And he was the only other writer of color. So I just went into his office and I was like, hey, we're going to be best friends, right? <laughs> and I was like, just tell me what to do. And he was like, look, he's like, you have to talk. He's like, you can't not talk because you, people start to resent you if you never talk. Yeah because you're sort of wasting a spot that someone else could have had. And then he said, the showrunners are the painters and we're the paint. He was like, figure out what color you are. And when they need, so he's like, if you're red, which is like story, if you're blue, which is jokes, like be red when they need it. But if they're looking for a blue, don't try to be blue. Like just, just yep. find your spot and stay in it. Yep. And then over time you'll get good at all the other yep. stuff. And so I was like a story person. And so I just focused on story and focused on story and then slowly started getting jokes in and getting more comfortable. But there is like a lot of like building an emotional currency with the room. And I think people want to just like shine immediately and be like, but I'm so great. And yeah. it's like, you might be, but you also might be like annoying. So you have to kind of like. <laughs> and, like <laughs> and once you're deemed the annoying writer in the room, really yeah. hard it's to hard dig, to dig out. out. I was going to say, a lot of people are like, half the job is who do we want to hang out with for 10 hours a yeah. day? Yeah, Unfortunately, but that's why rooms became really homogenous for so long. True. So Showrunners also need to like get over that. And I purposely look for people that I'm like, we are nothing alike. You know, you don't want to hire assholes, but like you want to hire people that think differently than you, you know, for sure. Um, I want to pivot slightly because one of the things I also find really great about all of your shows is your opening theme song slash credit sequence. Like it really, they all set up the world so well. And I feel like this is something that a lot of shows don't do anymore. So I was wondering if we could talk a little, especially Phil, because you also perform. Great group. Um, hey. Talk a little bit about like why it was important to do this, and if you do feel like it was maybe a hurdle to get the network to agree to give you the time to do it when you only have a voice. No. Cabernet and Sauvignon team. Hey. That's our theme song. Um, you know, it was I. I, I Watching shows in the 90s, I, yeah. they just did such a good job of being like, we're going to give you a nice, long theme song that's going <laughs> to ease you into this world. And then, and then the show happens. You're like, oh, that was great. And I feel like 
over time, uh, it just became like super short, like yeah. title card, and then you're into the show. Uh, and just given the nature of Grand Crew being a hangout show, kind of a throwback in a lot of ways to kind of the, the hangout style, um, I just wanted to uh, create a, a nice long 16 yeah. second like uh, theme song. And I make music also separately outside of doing TV stuff. And so I linked up with my producer. Um, his name is Nick Lee. He is like a he's a he's a wonder kid. He's he's a genius. He he co-produced. Um, uh, Industry Baby by, by Lil Nas X. So he's like a, he's an amazing producer. We got in the studio, tossed around a bunch of ideas, and then that's what ended up being uh, the theme song for Grand Crew. And NBC was totally on board for it. Um, I think they, they initially were like, oh, we have different houses that kind of do that. But I was like, I think I'm going to try and take care of it. And then they liked it when they heard it. So that was, it was pretty seamless. Is it going to be the same every season? I think it's I'm assuming, we, right? I think we're going to keep yeah. it. Yeah. We're the but, only weird ones that don't. Yeah, we have, we have, we have a, a 16 second version and like a four second version in a, because we have four? T- a four to six seconds. I forget if it's six seconds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just Grand Crew. <laughs> it, it literally is. It's literally the end part where it's just Grand Crew, Grand Crew, Grand Crew, Grand Crew. <laughs> that's it. Uh, but that's when it's like, oh man, we're not making time. Right. You know okay. what I mean? But my goal for the second season is to do the long version for every as week. every yeah. week. Yeah. That's an assi- a, a, a challenge I have for myself because I think it does a nice job of like kind of transitioning into yeah. the show. So, Sarah, what inspired the animation part in yours? Um, well, we um, we were supposed to film in New Jersey, I think, or New York for a couple of weeks every season and do exteriors to help it give this like really more accurate. Um, feel and then with COVID that all went out the window and so it ended up being you know the Paramount back lot where they shot Back to the Future and I was like jazzed I was like when I tell my cousins that we're making an Indian TV show on the Back to the Future lot um, but we wanted to kind of really give a sense of like place and location and the idea of um, that that like Native people you know, the, the native people we show um, in the credits, they're like wearing baseball caps and jeans and they're hanging out and they're pushing strollers and just kind of like taking you into that world and sort of kind of subliminally explaining to you and giving you a sense of place so that when we like drop you into the cold open, yeah. you feel like you're there. Um, I liked Mad Men. I loved how like Mad Men did that of sort of like subliminally yeah. tricking you into like yeah. the themes and you're in this office and then suddenly you don't realize that you're in Los Angeles. And then um, our co-composers, David Schwartz, who did The Good Place and Northern Exposure, and then um, Tim and Bear, who are these incredible indigenous music makers um, called The Hallucination, formerly A Trap Called Red. And they were really, um, they're really incredible music producers and used a lot, they use a lot of like powwow beats and traditional native like flute sounds and turn it into like hip hop and um, cumbia and all different kinds of stuff. And what I really like about that is I feel like TV will often use native sounds as like it's something cheesy or it's like something terrible. And so I was like, whoever is in charge of those sounds like has to be native, has to be like innovative in what they're doing. And so they created um, the theme song together working with David's daughter because it was uh, COVID and she had been quarantining (laughs) with her dad. And Ed had this idea for, um, there's some sequence in Butch Cast and the Sundance Kid where it's like kind of like, like, it's not Bubba Buzz, it's like Bala oh, Laws, yeah. or whatever. And he brought that idea, and so they took that and made that song, and then Hallucination remixed it and worked with David to rewrite it. And so it's got this sort of kind of old throwback feel, but it's also very indigenous, and then it's also very like contemporary. Mm. Which is like what we wanted the show to be. Right. We just got Meg the Stallion. <laughs> um, <laughs> We got Meg, and then second season we got Chameleon, who's starring in Rap Shit, who's coming, that's coming out on HBO Max. Y'all just behind. People are like, put Meg back. I'm like, no, Meg blew up, but like Chameleon is right there. And then this year, TMP, and in like two years, we're just ahead of the time, I'm telling you. Um, but no, I love, I love getting songs that are like unreleased. We have really great um, music team. We have Amanda Jones, who's this Oscar and Emmy nominated black lady composer. She's amazing. We have a music supervisor who used to do Glee. Like she is good at getting stuff for us, but. Um, yeah, like, we just want to get the hot shit, like, and be ahead of it. Um, Meg, nobody knew who Megan Thee Stallion was in the summer of 2019, except for the people who were listening to our mixtapes, but now she's obviously major. So I think we'll just kind of always be ahead of it that way. Even on my late night show, like, I got Questlove to do our theme song. I don't know, I'm just really, like, I just want the hot shit, you know? I want people to be like, 
I heard that song at a Black Lady Sketch Show. You know, we can't really put them a lot in the sketches. Um, the Roxy mentioned sketch, we got a big Frida gave us an unreleased song for that sketch, but like usually there's just not, it just doesn't make sense really to be in there like, what if I'm three isn't gonna have like, you know, <laughs> Megan the Stallion in it. But I mean, um, we don't know season four. Maybe, maybe, you never know. But um, our music budget only goes so far. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we try to be strategic about it. But for us, the opening credits, so I came to Andrew, you know what I said? So we, I directed the opening credits for the first season after production. So we were done shooting, we were in post, and I was like, we need opening credits. But the cast was gone, right? They were on to other things and not available. And I was like, uh, maybe puppets. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did. Um, and then we shot did you know it like, the right puppets? before we aired. Wait, 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 did you know the puppets were gonna be so important in the end of season three? Like, how did that connect? <laughs> So to be fair, we thought about the puppets when the writers were still in the room, but we decided against it. We hadn't made any decisions. So the puppets had been talked about in the narrative. Um, I didn't know exactly back in 2019 how they would be used this year, but it was pretty clear pretty quickly that they would become a part of the series in, in, the, in the long run. But yeah, every, I know everybody gets on me. They're like, I like the different world credits. I like the puppet credits. I got, like every season, it becomes somebody else's new favorite, which is fine. This season, I was just like, so HBO was like, we don't really do opening credits. And I was like, I've seen Game of Thrones. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, <laughs> but then they were like, no, like think about it. the comedies. Like Insecure is just kind of like a thing. Yeah. And it's so rare, I was huh? like, okay, I get it, but don't think about it like opening credits, think about it like a sketch. And they were like, okay, now we're in, now we're in. Actually, they never really were against it. They were just like, ah, oh, it's not kind of our thing, but like whatever you want to do. So, um, so we did it, they loved it. And then second season, oh, it was so big, it took forever to shoot that. But then I was like, okay, so I know people are gonna be mad that the puppets aren't there, so I'm gonna do something different, because I always want to keep people guessing. So they changed a little bit every week. And then this year, <laughs> <laughs> this year I was just like, I want to annoy people in the way that, you know how when like on a TV show, somebody will say, hey Siri or Alexa, and then your shit will go off, like at, at your house. I was like, okay, how can I force people to be involved in the opening credits? And so I just made the text longer and longer. Like I was like, you're gonna have to pause this. You're gonna have to read it. It was also a bit of a red herring for the end of the world. I wanted to mislead people into thinking, well, why is this so important? What is happening here? Um, in this like Dynasty Real Housewives kind of um, uh, uh, motif. So it, it really, and okay, exclusive. It really has to do with, um, yeah, it really has to do with um, the world that Dr. Hadassah created. And it has to do, spoiler, sorry if you didn't see the finale. <laughs> She controlled it all. Um, uh, the world that she created and that in that world, these women can truly become anything and go on these paths. And so now they're having to forge their own lives, but what are we doing with these characters that they've all been playing and how do they start to live in their world together, right? So that starts to mash up in the last sketch of the season where Octavia and Trinity meet. I'm getting very inside baseball for those of you who haven't seen the show. But the point is characters who have never met and have lived in seemingly different worlds have now started to meet. So everything started to fold in That's on tight. itself. Yeah. The so, Robin Thede multiverse? It's the Black Lady multiverse, <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, but, but that'll be interesting to see it's gonna break open what we can do in seasons four and beyond. And I was just gonna say, so you got renewed for season four, so obviously like that sets up how we yeah, yeah. Is there anything you guys can say about your upcoming season? Season two of Brotherhood Falls is like next week. Yeah, premieres June, June 16th. 16th. So it's not um, literally yeah. next week. I'm very excited. Um, I love it. I think it's really, really good. Like, <laughs> no, I feel like, you know, season one, I'm, I'm so proud of that. But, it, you know, we were technically like the first Native American sitcom. Yes! I feel like, yes! Uh, <laughs> yes! Okay, you can clap more than that. That's a very big deal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Reservation Dogs came out very shortly after, but while we were making it, we were like, holy shit, and I'm a very superstitious Navo, so I was like, this is never gonna be on television, like, and Mike Schur's like, yes, it will. I was like, you've never been on shows that were canceled before, Mike. Like, this is gonna, you know, and, but it, it was, so we felt this real responsibility to put as much story and as much information because you had all these, like, you know, people who came before you who didn't get the chance to do it, and so we put everything in there that we wanted to say, and now that we have the season two, and we felt so much love from, you know, Indian country, we felt like we had a kind of like, okay, what are the stories we want to tell? What are the stories that we yeah. enjoy? And so there's a lot more like romantic comedy. There's a really wonderful kind of rom, I mean, yeah, Phil Jackson. I love rom-coms. <laughs> we love rom-coms. Love it. Um, I want to be Navajo Nora Afron, right? So I was like, let's do, 
let's have, you know, Regan go through um, a, a love story. You never get to see two Native yeah. people in love. It's always, like, sad trauma, and there's, like, one hand holding. Or if they are, one of them's about to get killed. One of them's about to get yeah. killed, or it's like they, like, kind of touch each other through the glass <laughs> of the prison cell or something, and, like, credits roll. So I wanted just, like, a fun, like, you know, <laughs> rompy rom-com, because I have so much of that in my family and in my life and stuff, and so... <laughs> So you know exactly yes, what I'm talking I about. Do. And so, like, you know, season premiere we had um, yesterday, and Michael Grice, who's a trained dancer, <laughs> he and he and his wife did the dance from Dirty Dancing. And during that sequence, when we were filming, because I was like, and then he'll do the dance from Dirty Dancing. It was like this like silly thing that actually happened. It was so crazy. And when we were filming it, Tasba, uh, one of the writers who was covering set, just started yelling, we never get this! Like, oh. she was just like, it's a rally cry. And that kind of became a rallying cry for season two of just like, what is the shit we never get? Like, what is the stuff we never get to see? And so, and people are digging it, and I'm just like so, so excited for people to Do see Do you guys it. find you have to like, so I know first season, like, uh, the great thing about your show too is I think it explains the culture, but not in a preachy way. Like, you just get to see people living it. You know what I mean? And did you find that you got notes that were like, you're gonna have to explain that thing, and going into season two, did you feel less of that? Or was that ever a thing? No, I mean, it helps when you have, like, Mike Schur producing the show, and Ed Helms, because like, he'll be like, it'll work. And they're like, okay, you know? So, like, any kind of apprehension, they really trusted him and stuff, and he really trusted us, and so that was always very helpful. I also think, too, like, my whole life has been sort of, like, cogently explaining my culture in a way that people can understand. So working in museums and things. And so we just didn't want it to ever feel like homework. Yeah. Like we were like focused on the comedy and focusing on people understanding it. And it's like almost like we trick them into learning stuff. Yeah. And so our show has actually been included in like a lot of dissertations, a lot of like high school curriculum because there's so little native representation in like high school and elementary school curriculum. And so we were really excited to kind of like like every good story, you know, you learn, like I loved like The Godfather, that was like my favorite movie growing up and I watched it way too young. All of them actually, it's crazy, All I know, I know, I know. That is a whole other thing. I know, that's wow. crazy. My brother's named Michael after Michael Corleone, it's like. <laughs> So, but but like to me that was like you know yeah, yeah. when like they speak it's, it's, when they speak Italian it's not and, subtitled yeah. and like we, that's why we didn't subtitle the Mohawk like in our yeah. episode where he speaks it and so it's really about like like exhibiting the culture and not over explaining it but I'm also not afraid to explain it like I do yeah. love shows like you know like a different world and blackish and stuff growing up and like designing women like I feel like there were these like rallying cry explanations but it never felt like homework to me. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny, yeah. and the characters were Probably great, and characters. even where they were like aspirational, and you wanted to be like them. The I'll explain season. shit. <laughs> <laughs> People, anybody who's in my job, we don't explain shit. Uh, season two doesn't have a premiere date yet, but have you yeah. started working on it at all? Well, we have one, so we're yeah. gonna answer. Yeah. We're gonna answer those cliffhangers. Hangout show is just getting in season one. Yeah, I like them. I want to hang out with them. And so now that we have a season two, I just want to try and make this shit funnier. I just want to try and make, just explode the, oh my God, I have to keep using these terms. I want to expand the fun, guys. I'm so sorry. We're learning. Yeah, we're, we're learning. We're works here. in progress. Yeah, I want to expand, I want to expand on the fun. And also, the, I want the show to map kind of uh, my trajectory with learning more about wine. So I would like wine to be even even greater part of the show. Do y'all be drunk in the writer's room? Yes, yes or no? Do not lie to me. Do not lie to me. Do you drink and do you get drunk? Book two part questions. You are being filmed right now. Just be. Yes. I don't think you can answer that question. Yeah. So, a show about a group of uh, friends at a wine bar. Uh, we have wine. Yes. Do we get drunk? No, I would say we get okay. drunk, but yeah. But y'all have hang some out. wine. Yeah. We hang out. It's research. Yeah, we hang out. It's research. Research. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have. Now what's our excuse? <laughs> Because ours isn't about wine. No, I'm just kidding. We, we have like drink. five minutes left. I do want to try How to open rude. this up to the audience. I saw your hand, so <laughs> you're going to go first. Hi, all. Uh, thank you, first of all, for spending time with us. Uh, it's been fantastic listening to all of these Oh, quite a little So um, I, I love all the shows. Um, Robin, uh, first of all, what up on three? Just had to throw that out. What up on three? Um, <laughs> I was curious, your, your show is interesting in the sense that it's a sketch show that is theoretically a narrative show. Like the end of season three essentially says, hey, everything you've seen is actually connected to each other. And so I'm curious in that sense, does your show have like a Bible, like in a loose sense? Like do you 
theoretically know where this is going if you get to 60s and Danielle 70s. Danielle asks me this every time. Yes. Uh, yes and no, and the Bible is in my head and my head only. <laughs> uh, the writers, I actually rewrote the ending. The ending that went, so the writers finish writing before we go into production, and then they don't go to set except for the head writers and the writer-producer, but um, the ending that they left the writer's room having written was rewritten by me and shot, given to the crew three days before we shot it. So they had no idea. Um, none of my cast had any idea um, what was, uh, the network knew, obviously, but... Um, no, I like to throw curveballs because I want to keep um, the cast guessing. And it's not to screw anybody over. It's just that sometimes I'm constantly changing it. I think I told you this, Danielle, but I had three different endings. Um, it was all the same sort of ending, but who is controlling them was different. And I kept waffling back and forth based on the amount of Easter eggs that we had left. But I leave it open so that anything can happen, but I, I have a trajectory that I'm following in my head. Is there any universe that you'll ever reveal who the other two people were? Who the other two people were? So you said that there were... Th oh, absolutely not. All right. <laughs> I, had I, to, I had to try. I had to try. No. I had to try. Good, I see. Good try. Uh, I will say that I asked her that, and she said the same thing to me like two months ago, but I really like that you followed up, because like, <laughs> if she answered it here, I was gonna be mad, but also excited. I know, no, you, she would've killed that. The show is because we built something that's so flexible with these characters and the Easter eggs are in every sketch back to, you know, people are like, oh shit, Angela Bassett did drink Millstone coffee like in Bad Bitch Support Group. That's crazy. Um, Nicole Pyre got thrown into a Millstone coffee box. Whoa, I didn't even connect that. Um, Millstone's been the Easter egg that's been in literally everything. But the sketches amongst themselves, like the Patti LaBelle on my own poster will show up two seasons later in another sketch in the background. So there's all of, it, it actually makes it more flexible in terms of like how to resolve those endings. And I think by season three, I was like, the audience deserves an answer. <laughs> does the art department pitch on it? Like, yes. do, do you want to use it? That's the yes. best. That's the best, because yes. they're like invested in we it. We have these amazing ladies, Cindy and Michelle. Um, it's like an all women of color team. They're fantastic. Um, they, uh, they bring so much, and they're both Asian, so they bring in like their cultural things, even though it's a black lady sketch. They'll go, okay, well, in our culture, we have superstitions about this and this and this. And I'm like, actually, that dovetails with something that we have. So they're really interesting conversations. But yeah, they, they they do a ton of that work. And so I share a little bits and pieces with them that they know more than anybody else because they have to know, but they get it. We're very in tune, yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a question in the orange. <laughs> I was, oh, I'm sorry. It's like everybody. <laughs> everybody got orange on. The whole section is orange. Oh, yeah, she's like, literally, we're all so wearing orange. That's the whole everybody. point. <laughs> we're all banded together in orange. We know. Thank yes. you for not being like the Asian one. You are such an ally. Um, I'm really hoping that doesn't happen to you, but I'm, oh, I'm sure, sure it does. does. Every single flight. I mean, um, this does have to unfortunately be the last flight? question. What? Yeah. Stop my spirit! Stop it! Um, I, I do have to say this does have to be the last question. No, I apologize. Did you want me to start? She, she has a wrap-up sign. All right. What is the? <laughs> So, like, to your point earlier, like, there, there has been talent, like, there has been the talent, there has been the bench, there has been the ambition. What, what happened for, for, you know, people of color to finally break through at this level? Like, did we get, you know, a good white boy on the inside? Did we, did, like, a, a scandal happen? Like, what, what happened that finally... Before you answer, I'm gonna say something she's probably not gonna say. I am DB her. First of all, this woman's credits, this woman's talent, like, it's not like she just showed up in Hollywood and like was like, oh, I have an idea, you know? It's like, you have to be seven times as good, 10 times as good, you know what I mean? So anyway, go ahead, give your answer. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Give your answer, that's but she's an actual say. literal genius. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm a literal genius, and that's why, no. No! <laughs> no. <laughs> Sure things. I think I will go very fast. I think it's streaming. I think it's more opportunity. I think people have run out of stories and run out of ideas. I will also say though that streaming sites are paying people much less money and I don't think it's a mistake that people suddenly like marginalized voices when they don't want to pay people their money. Say it! So say it. to me that is like 
there will be true equity when there's actual equity and when people get budgets and people get time and things like that. I feel very, very, um, like because of Mike Sure, because of Ed Helms, I'm afforded an experience that is not everyone's experience and I have the training to kind of step up to that moment. But there are a lot of people making incredible shows that do not have the budgets they deserve, that do not have the crews they deserve, they do not have, and everyone's working hard. Those crews are overworked. And then and they get canceled because they're and like, then oh, they nobody watch it. It's like, well, you gave us $5. And then you gave us $5 and you didn't yeah. promote us and you overworked the crew. So I do think that's like a larger conversation to have. But I also think, like, we grew up loving television. Like, we grew up in, like, knowing our own identities and just push through and push through. I think Shonda Rhimes, I think, like, we owe so much to black showrunners and filmmakers for creating this template for so many other marginalized communities and voices. But, yeah, I think it's, it's a mixture of things. For Native people specifically, I think Standing Rock. I think Standing Rock and Taika Waititi making Thor Ragnarok and winning an Oscar, like, changed the game for a lot of us. Do you like think about your place in history? Yes and no. Yeah. We have to talk about it in the next panel. Yeah. Okay. I was all just right. gonna say that. That was a deep <laughs> question. I like saying your questions. I'm just sitting here going, God, that's okay. All right. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think it's it goes back to an earlier point that we were talking about where there's more platforms for content, and then I think it's that combined with the fact that they give voices of color opportunities and the stuff is dope. <laughs> so it's like, oh. It's like there's more opportunity, the stuff happens, it's stuff that people actually gravitate towards and that they find an audience for. And so I think that's part of the reason why, of the why now. Um, and my hope is that it, it continues because there's so, so much talent out there. And it's because of y'all. You guys are the ones saying we want different content. Keep using your voice, especially online. They're watching that. Don't think that they're not. They're watching that and they're listening. So keep it up. Well, thank everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.